In this video, I'm going to be talking about the different types of collagen. Now let's get right back into this video. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about collagen. And I know that when I say collagen, people start to have their heart race a little bit because as you know, there are four types of collagen, type one, type two, type three, and type four. And if you've taken any practice questions yet whatsoever, you probably know that test writers love collagen. And I think the reason that they love collagen is because there are such subtle differences between the four types of collagen in terms of where they're found, how, they're, how they work, what they do, and what type of diseases manifest when you have a defect in any one of these four types. And then of course, each of those diseases has its own unique set of symptoms and buzzwords. So this topic really does allow test writers on Comlex and USMLE to come up with challenging questions that tie things like pathology to biochemistry to pathophysiology, etc. So in today's video, I'm gonna break all of this down. We'll go through the different types of collagen one at a time. We'll talk about things like where the collagen's located, what it's doing, what tissues you find it in, and what types of diseases you can expect if there's a defect or mutation in the formation of that collagen. We will, of course, provide mnemonics for all of these different things, which will make this very easy to remember. So let's dive right in and get started with type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen is the strongest and most abundant form of collagen in the body, and it's typically found in tissues where increased tensile strength is required. And those tissues would be bones, tendons, the cornea, and skin. So in these in these tissues, you need increased tensile strength because of what those tissues actually do on a physiologic level. Now, the disease that, that comes up when you have a problem with type 1 collagen is osteogenesis imperfecta. And this is a favorite of test writers because it's got very unique symptoms. Now, this is an autosomal dominant mutation that affects collagen 1A1 or 1A2 gene. But what's very high yield for you to take away from this lecture and memorize for test day is the classic constellation of symptoms that you'll see. Now, what are those? Well, you get non-traumatic fractures, meaning the person with osteogenesis imperfection will have a fracture, but it's not gonna be because they banged their arm against a desk or that they were playing baseball and someone hit them with a bat accidentally and they fractured their bone. These fractures occur seemingly randomly without any inciting trauma. And that is because the bone is weak because you, don't have, you have a defect in type 1 collagen. You also see blue sclera. Now, that picture in the center of this slide is the highest yield picture probably in today's video because test writers love to put this in the question and ask you further questions about either type 1 collagen or the disease or the pathophysiology. And what's happening here is that because you have a decreased or defect in type 1 collagen, you're getting translucency of the connective tissue that lies over the choroid. And because it's translucent, you actually see the blue sclera. And that wouldn't typically happen in somebody who had normally functioning type 1 collagen. The last symptom is that you get deafness. Because in the bones that make up the middle ear, those bones actually require type 1 collagen. So therefore, if you have a mutation in the Col1A1 or Col1A2 gene, and type 1 collagen cannot be formed, then you can't adequately perform the function of those middle ear bones. And if those middle ear bones aren't working, then obviously you're going to experience deafness. So these three symptoms are what you need to take away for osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a disease that manifests with a problem with type 1 collagen. Now let's go back to our opening slide. It's very, very high yield that for each of these different types of collagen, you know the different tissues where they're found. Don't ask me why, but it comes up all the freaking time. So how do you memorize that type 1 collagen occurs in bone, tendon, cornea, and skin? Well, we're going to rewrite re these words using the word 1, because after all, we're, typing, we're, we're talking about type 1 collagen. So bone has 1 in it. Tendon has 1 in it. Cornea, I kind of fudged it a little bit, but it has 1 in it. And instead of skin, we'll say skin tone, and the word tone has one in it. So bone, tendon, conia, and skin tone. They all have the word one in it, which should remind you that all of these tissues are highly comprised of type one collagen. 
So that's everything that you need to know for type 1 collagen. Do you remember the four different types of tissues, that it's the most abundant type of collagen and performs a strengthening role, and that if there's a problem with it, it causes osteogenesis imperfecta marked by non-traumatic fractures, blue sclera, and deafness. Let's roll right into type 2 collagen. Type 2 collagen is what's referred to as the spongy type of collagen. And the spongy type of collagen, its responsibility is to absorb shock from compressive forces. So perhaps unsurprisingly, it will be found in tissues where compressive force occurs. And those are things like cartilage, the vitreous body, and nucleus pulposus. Now, for type 2 collagen, there's no disease that you need to memorize. There's no disease that will come up if type 2 collagen doesn't work. Instead, really the only thing that you need to know are the three tissues that you see on this slide, cartilage, vitreous body, and nucleus pulposus, and memorize that those are all comprised of type 2 collagen. So, I know what you're thinking. Dirty, how the heck do I remember this? Well, the way that you're going to remember this is we're going to put the word 2 in each of these different tissues. So instead of saying cartilage, you're gonna say cartilage, cartilage. Instead of saying vitreous, you're gonna say vitreous, the vitreous body, instead of the vitreous body. And instead of saying nucleus pulposus, you're gonna say nutuous pulposus. And I'm stretching the words a little bit here, but just like with type one collagen, I think that for type two collagen, simply inserting the number two works beautifully. So cartilage, vitreous body and nutuous pulposus. That's type 2 collagen performing its spongy role in helping against compressive forces. And now because there's no disease you need to memorize, we are done with type 2 collagen. So that's the easy one. That is the easiest of the four by far. Type 3 collagen is a little bit more complex. Type 3 collagen is the webby type of collagen. And the webby type of collagen is there to assist with pulling forces. Now, unsurprisingly, because it's assisting with pulling forces, it will only be found in tissues where pulling forces occur. And those are going to be things like blood vessels, the uterine tissues, fetal tissues, and granulation tissues. If you think about the role that each of those different tissues and vessels perform, it should be no surprise that type 3 collagen will assist in the natural pulling that occurs in each of those tissues. Now, for type 3 collagen, there is a disease that you need to memorize, and that disease that will occur when you have a problem with type 3 collagen is Ehlers-Danlos type 4. Now, it's a little tricky here because type 3 collagen causes a type 4 Ehlers-Danlos, but for the purposes of tests and examinations, usually you can just get away with memorizing Ehlers-Danlos. But if you want to get that 280 on USMLA, you need to know that this is Ehlers-Danlos type 4 specifically. Now, the problem here is that you do have deficient type 3 procollagen, and therefore type 3 collagen never fully arises. And the constellation of symptoms that you need to memorize are shown on this slide. So the first is that you get a berry or a saccular aneurysm in the cerebral, in the cerebral vasculature. You can also see organ rupture bleeding and bruising, and a very unique feature, mitral valve prolapse. So these symptoms occur in Ehlers-Danlos type 4, which is due to type 3 deficient pro-collagen and therefore the fully mature type 3 collagen. Now let's go back to our starting slide. How do you remember that type 3 collagen occurs in blood vessels, uterine tissues, fetal tissues, and granulation tissues? Well, my mnemonic is to abbreviate and then write the letter three after. So instead of blood vessels, we write BV for blood vessels, but BV3. All of these rhyme. So you've got BV3 for blood vessels, UT3 for uterine tissues, FT3 for fetal tissues, and GT3 for granulation tissues. And if you can memorize this, you should be able to recall these four different types of tissues that have type three collagen. Now, taking my mnemonic even one step further, if we go back to the symptoms of Ehlers-Danlos type 4, you can take the two highest yield symptoms and put them right on this slide. They're berry aneurysm and mitral valve prolapse. Berry, you can say ber 3 right? 3 for type 3 collagen. And mitral valve prolapse is often abbreviated MVP, which not only rhymes with everything else that we've talked about, BV3, UT3, FT3, GT3, but it has three letters. So this is super simple to memorize for test day. You just need to remember the disease, Ehlers-Danlos type 4, the two very high yield symptoms that you see on this slide, the berry slash saccular aneurysm and mitral valve prolapse, 
and then the four different types of tissues, which again are super easy to memorize using my mnemonic where you just abbreviate them and they all rhyme. That's type three collagen. Let's conclude today's video by talking about type four collagen. Now type four collagen might be the collagen that gets tested the most on test day. It's located in the basement membrane and it provides stabilization of the cell by stabilizing the basement membrane. The tissues that it's found in include the kidney, the ear, the eye, and skin. And it shouldn't surprise you that in just a moment when we talk about the different diseases that can come up when you have a problem with type 4 collagen, you have problems with the kidney, the ear, the eye, or the skin. Now, type 4 collagen throws a lot of medical students off when they're learning in their preclinical years as well as when they're actually trying to take USMLE and Comlex because there are three different diseases that all become implicated in type 4 collagen. And I'm going to go through the differences and the subtleties and, and break this down for you so that you don't poop in your pants because I know you're sitting there and you're like, dirty, no, not type 4. Relax, okay? So there's three diseases we need to talk about. Outport syndrome, good pasture syndrome, and epidermolysis bullosa. All of these have some problem with type 4 collagen. So let's go through them one at a time. We'll first talk about the cause of them and the symptoms, and then we'll go for the really high yield extra tidbits, okay? So for Alport syndrome, this is just a pure mutation in type 4 collagen. And because you know that type 4 collagen is found in the kidney, in the eye, in the ear, the symptoms shouldn't surprise you. So you get progressive nephritis, ocular dysfunction, and deafness, okay? That's Alport syndrome. There are some other symptoms. This is not an all-inclusive list, but just to keep it general and to give you the overview here, that's what you see. And that one, Alport syndrome, is due to the pure mutation of type 4 collagen. Now, good pasture syndrome, which sometimes get con gets confused with Alport syndrome, is not a mutation of type 4 collagen, but rather it is an immune response. It is an autoantibody against type 4 collagen. So you see this, the subtle difference here is that Alport syndrome is just type 4 collagen itself is completely screwed. But in good pasture syndrome, it's the formation of that autoantibody that gives rise to the symptoms. Those symptoms are rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and then problems with the lungs, which include hemoptysis, shortness of breath, and cough. Now in good pasture syndrome on test day, the way that they'll go after this is to either give you the symptoms, which is honestly less likely, or what they'll actually do is show you a picture and it'll either be under a microscope or a, or a kidney biopsy and they're going to stain that biopsy. And you're going to see one of two pictures. Those pictures are shown here on this slide. And, and I understand that the pictures are tiny on this slide, but it, you can see what you need to see. The first picture in pink on top shows you what's called crescent formation. So in good pasture syndrome, in these rapidly progressive glomerulonephritides, you see the formation of crescents. And the way that you can remember that, and the mnemonic I always use, was that instead of saying rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, I always referred to this as rapidly crescentic glomerulonephritis, which reminded me that in all rapidly progressive glomerulonephritides, of which good pasture syndrome is one, you get the formation of crescents. The second picture is showing linear deposits of IgG along the basement membrane. Because good pasture syndrome is the formation of autoantibodies, those autoantibodies deposit in a linear formation. So you see in this picture, they've stained it and there's IgG deposits along the basement membrane. So those are two super high yield pictures for good pasture syndrome. You should either be able to recognize the picture by simply looking at it or be able to recognize the buzzword, which might say crescent formation. It might say rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis with crescents in the nephron, or it might say linear IgG deposits in the basement membrane. If they say either of those things, they're talking about good pasture syndrome, which is the autoantibody against type 4 collagen. The last disease that we need to briefly go over, which is the lowest yield of the three, but it comes up, is epidermolysis bullosa. And I know you're sitting there and you're thinking, what? Why did, how does this have to do with type 4 collagen? The problem here is that the mutation in the type 4 collagen causes a weak union of the dermis and epidermis. And because that top layer and the next layer below it don't come together appropriately, you get blistering fragile skin. So that's the only reason it's related to type 4 collagen. 
But the takeaway from this slide is that you need to know that all three of these diseases have something to do with type 4 collagen. And therefore, this gives test writers an opportunity to ask you questions about pathology, about disease, when they start the question giving you an overview of something like biochemistry or the formation of type 4 collagen. Now let's go back to our slide here. I told you that type 4 collagen was located in the basement membrane and provided stabilization of the cell. So, so the, really what you need to take away from this is that type 4 collagen is found in the basement membrane. And if you need a stupid mnemonic to learn that, the way that I always remembered it was I thought about baseball because there are four bases in baseball. So four reminded me of the four in type 4 collagen and bases or baseball reminded me of basement membrane. And that's it. I know it's pretty dumb, but hey, it works. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We've gone through the four different types of collagen. We've talked about what their role is, what tissues they're found in. I've given you mnemonics, and we talked about diseases that come up when the collagen doesn't work or there's some type of mutation. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Give me a comment. More videos are coming. Love you all. Good luck.